Let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 32 and set the year of this event. The word that came to Jeremiah from he who is in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now that would be 588 BC. And we've been looking at things happening in that particular year already. Now it doesn't tell us what season of the year it was. All we know is that somewhere in this year, that, verse 2, at that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. So it's while the besiegement is still happening, and Jeremiah is still locked up in the official prison. Verse 3, For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says he who is, Behold, I'm giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall see, shall speak to him face to face, and see him eye to eye, and he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares he who is. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. Now that's a big long quote of why King Zedekiah is not happy with Jeremiah, and why he threw him into jail. Uh, now, the, the event that precipitated Jeremiah's arrest, you might remember, happened the previous year in 589, apparently during the spring of that time, uh, maybe the early summer, when Pharaoh uh, comes up against the Babylonians and the Babylonians suspend the siege for a little bit, which allowed Jeremiah to try to go out of the city a few miles north into Benjamin territory to his native town of Anatoth to do some personal business. But the guard at the gate arrests him and accuses him of defecting to the Babylonians. And uh, then he ends up being uh, brought before the king, and the king says all the things that we just saw here, that... How dare you speak pro-Babylonian stuff? How dare you say that the city's going to be taken, there's nothing we can do about it, and that I myself as king am going to be taken into exile after I've seen Nebuchadnezzar face to face? How dare you say all that? So they've classified Jeremiah as a traitor and therefore have kept him in custody for probably a little bit more than a year by the time this story happens. So here it is. Verse 6, Jeremiah said, The word of he who is came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, By my field that is at Anatoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. So this might be tied in somehow with the family business that he was trying to take care of when he got arrested at the gate. Uh, He's got a cousin, Hanamel, uh, who's probably near his age, and we would assume that Jeremiah must be somewhere in his early 60s if he was about 20 when his ministry started, because we're almost four decades later. Uh, So, Hanamel is not some young man. He seems to be an older gentleman, and he can't afford to take care of some of the family farm. So, he wants Jeremiah to step in and uh, pay off some debts and take control of the family farm. Verse number eight, then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of he who is, and said to me, buy my field that is at Anathoth 
in the land of Benjamin for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. And then I knew that this was the word of he who is. So his cousin comes into the prison and meets with him and says, I need you to do the family a favor. You need to buy my field from me so that I can get out of debt. Uh, Now, the reason that this happens is because they want to keep the family farms in the family line. Every 50th year, all the land leases uh, end anyway, and all properties revert to the original family lines, but there's still the desire to keep the family farms in the family line uh, as much as is possible. So that's why Hanamel is showing up here. Uh, Now, that's a strange thing to be trying to do when your country's being overrun by a foreign entity. And that's the point here. Verse number nine. I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and I weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. Now, this is before coins came into existence. So everything was sold by weight of a precious metal, in this case, silver. Now, the later shekels will represent in some fashion the original value that is in mind here. So a shekel tends to be a couple of days' wages. So we're here, we're seeing here uh, somewhere in the name, uh, in the neighborhood of a month, a month and a half of work, uh, several thousands of dollars uh, that this field indebtedness is going to cost Jeremiah. So verse number 10, I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase. That's the official record. It's sealed shut in the front of witnesses. Containing the terms and the conditions and the open copy. That's the personal uh, record for Jeremiah himself to have so that he can read it. Uh, at any time he wishes. Verse 12, And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Mashiach, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. So this is all happening at the jail. It's all happening there at the prison. And he takes the official uh, record, sealed up. Uh, He takes the copy for his own personal use, and in front of everyone, he talks to his assistant, Baruch. Verse 13, I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says he who is of the armies, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, Put them in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. So they would take written materials and put them in sealed earthenware jars. This is one of the reasons for the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, is because they were still doing that many hundreds of years later. And uh, those, uh, those written documents of the Essenes... Uh, down at Qumran, were put in earthenware jars, sealed up, and hidden away in caves uh, because of the great Jewish-Roman War. Uh, Of course, they ended up dying or being uh, taken away as slaves, so they never got back to get those earthenware jars with their documents. And so they were found more than... uh, Uh, 1,300 years later, and uh, they are great treasures for us today. So something like that is what we're talking about, is take this written document or these written documents, put them in a storage container so that they can be stored away safely. Verse 15, for thus says he who is of the host, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. So even though it looks like the whole 
land is about to be overrun by the Babylonians, the very thing that Jeremiah has been predicting for four decades, just because there's going to be the exile and the death of lots and lots of people is not going to end the inheritance rights to land and property of the Israeli people. So Jeremiah is transacting this this transfer of money in uh, respect to land in faith that this document will hold up in court later that this property belongs to his family. Verse number 16. After I'd given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to he who is, saying, Ah, he who is God, or my Lord, he who is. It is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O great and mighty God, whose name is he who is of the armies, great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are opened all the ways of the children of men, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Very long sentence. Uh, but it takes bits and pieces of other passages of Scripture that describe God as eminently fair, but also very much compassionate. He wants to show mercy and compassion to those that want a relationship with him, but he does bring judgment on those who go directly against him. And that feeds into the whole reason that the Babylonians are besieging Jerusalem at this moment because Jerusalem has gotten so bad, the people of the Judean kingdom, so bad that God is invoking the negative consequences, uh, the curses, if you will, of the covenant. Verse number 20, you, meaning you, God, have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and to this day in Israel and among all mankind, and have made a name for yourself as is this day. So he goes all the way back to the beginning of Israel's history as a nation, back in Egypt with the ten plagues, God demonstrating his power and judgment. Verse 21, you brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. And you gave them this land, which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. One of the things that we see very prominent in uh, Jewish prayers is a recounting of history and a confession of the sins of those that came before and of your own generation. And so here he is praying about the exodus being a fulfillment of promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 23, they entered and took possession of this land. So that's a reference to Joshua's time. God kept his promise, brought the Israelis into the promised land. But, verse 23 continues, they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do, and therefore you have made all this disaster come upon them. So what's happening right now outside the walls is directly related to the way that Israel lived in the land. Yes, they had good times, high times where they behaved themselves. They had revivals from time to time. But the vast majority of Israeli history, and you can check this for yourself by reading through Uh, the Judges and the Samuels and the Kings and the Chronicles. The vast majority of the history is about them disobeying, sinning, and ignoring the warning of prophets from God. So, verse 24, Behold, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it. 
because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. We've seen this trio of things. Sword, meaning direct military action, a lot of physical death from that. Famine, because there's not enough food to go around during a war. And pestilence, because of the diseases that run rampant in war zones. That's going to end up with the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, taking the city and destroying it. What you spoke has come to pass, and behold, you see it. So this is all fulfillment of God's God's curse upon the nation for abandoning the covenant. Verse three or twenty-five. Yet you, O oh, He who is our God, have said to me, "Buy the field for money and get witnesses." Though the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans, so God. Even though all this is happening and judgment is falling, you're telling me there's a future that I need to have documentation about the transfer of hereditary lands. Verse 26. The word of he who is came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am he who is, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Thus says he who is, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall come and set this city on fire and burn it with the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. So yes, You are correct, Jeremiah. The Babylonians are coming. They're going to burn this place to the ground. They're going to burn down houses whose tops had been turned into worship sites for pagan deities. So yes, judgment is coming. Verse 30, For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. So, throughout their history. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares he who is, that is, by their activities. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day, so that I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger. Their kings and their officials their priests and their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So this is all about history, the whole history of Israel. It's all just been building up until God's final final, um, patience was at an end. And then the judgment falls. And leaders played a big role in this because leaders have led into evil more often than not in Israeli history. Verse 33, they've turned to uh, me their back and not their face. Uh, The image is one of, of basically abandoning God and moving the other direction. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. So God has repeatedly given them his words, given him their, the prophecies, through his prophets, and they've blown it all off. Verse 34, we get into some really disgusting specifics. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They actually put idols in the temple compound, in the area where worship was only supposed to be done to God himself. Verse 35, they built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Uh, This particularly disgusting sin is repeated over and over again as a reason for God's patience to end. And that is the participation in the Moabite, Ammonite false faith by which they get drunk, 
have sex with the intention of making the women pregnant and then killing off the last babies conceived in that ceremony as some sort of human sacrifice to Kimosh Molech, the destroyer king, uh, the god who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zebuim, uh, and, who, uh, and who then gave the start of the Moabite and Ammonite um, uh, communities through the incest of Lot and his two daughters. See, that's the twistedness uh, that has come up over time. And now that, that sacrifice of purposely bred babies uh, is one of the main reasons that God's patience is done. Verse 36, Now therefore, thus says he who is the God of Israel, concerning the city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell in safety and they shall be my people and I will be their God. It is hopeful that we see in all of these prophetic books amidst all of the graphic judgment talk, promises of return, promises of redemption, so that the Israelis, at least some of them, some of their descendants, will be brought back here again and used by God as a righteous remnant to start fresh. And then from that growing community, he will bring the Messiah into the world and through that save even more. And then ultimately, when the time is right, the Messiah will come back, he will resurrect the righteous dead, he will transform the righteous living, and he will gather all of his saints to this particular part of the new heaven and new earth and establish his eternal kingdom. And there's almost always a hint of that ultimate kingdom uh, in these passages about returns. Uh, verse 39, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. And I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. Now that passage, that verse that phrase has to refer to eternity because we know that even after the Israelis returned under Zerubbabel and Ezra, Nehemiah, and reestablished the Jewish presence in the Holy Land, that sin continued and God eventually brought judgment in the form of the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem and uh, the Jewish people. And so, uh, this promise is not yet fulfilled of never allowing nothing but good to happen to them again. That will happen when Jesus returns. I will put my, uh, the fear of me in their hearts that they will not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. So, that's still to be looked forward to. Verse 42, for thus says he who is, just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. So you get the one and then you get the other. God is trying to be the righteous king of a righteous people. But when unrighteousness happens, he has to punish it. But his ultimate goal is to get turned around and bring the people back to a righteous relationship with him. Fields, uh, verse 43, shall be bought in this land of which you are saying, it's a desolation without man or beast. It's given into the hand of the Chaldeans. 
So now we get back again to the whole point of the illustration of this day. Jeremiah paid money in order to receive a deed of land that he then stored away that legal paperwork because eventually that paperwork will matter again because the land will be back in the hands of the Israeli people and they will need to show uh, the, the hereditary rights to these pieces of property. So verse 44, fields shall be bought with money, deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin, in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negeb, for I will restore their fortunes, declares he who is. So in that last line, he basically just goes over all the geographic uh, relations of the land of Judah at this time. Uh, the cities uh, that are up in Benjamin. Benjamin was associated with Judah at this time. Uh, and the city of Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, the cities of Benjamin, the cities that are in the hill country, but also the cities that are in the plain, the Shephelah, or the, the not quite as hilly, flatter land down toward the Med. And then the cities in the Negev, that's the southern part of Judah, uh, down in the northern Sinai. Because God says all of those places are going to be occupied again soon, and they will have deeds of ownership and transfer that will need uh, to be in existence. So we're pretty much out of time today. We still want to uh, do... Uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, uh, which says that the word of he who is came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. So we don't know how long 